So welcome to another edition of Becoming an Ayn Rand Hero, where we use the ideas of Ayn Rand and objectivism to create a life that's heroic, that we can't wait to wake up to. And today, I'm actually excited. Uh, Jennifer Andrew Grossman, also known as JAG, right? The new CEO of Atlas Society and a powerhouse woman in her own right, who, by the way, when she dresses up as Ayn Rand, in fact, I'll have to put, put the picture that I took with her as Ayn Rand uh, uh, underneath. Just fantastic Ayn Rand in a great Russian accent. Um, so Jennifer is the new CEO of Atlas Society, and she's pushing forward some bold initiatives to attract uh, people to the objectivist movement who might not otherwise come to it, right? as well as to further the Atlas Society's work in its academic form and its uh, social outreach and its educational purposes. And I've been looking forward to having a conversation with her since I met her at the last Atlas Summit. And uh, I'm glad to get started. We've got some provocative things to talk about today. <laughs> well, welcome, Jennifer. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. Yes, yes. So uh, as a tradition, I like to start off and ask, how did you get into Ayn Rand? What is your short origin story? How, how is it that you do this? Well, yeah, um, I would say that the prequel was some of my experiences in, in childhood that I had, uh, this was before b bullying became something that everybody liked to talk about. But I was getting bullied at a time when there was a lot of social engineering going on in our schools. Uh, you know, I grew up in liberal Massachusetts in the most liberal of, of towns, Newton. And uh, I found that I was getting kind of kicked around, literally, because, um, well, they said I was conceited. And I've definitely become a little vain as I've gotten older, but I think... <laughs> They meant was that I, I was uh, self-confident, that I had self-esteem, uh, that I didn't mind wearing weird things that other kids didn't read, wear. And so um, I had that first experience of being ostracized uh, uh, and bullied for things that really were... Um, that, you, that you considered to be your virtues and your strengths. Yes. Um, and then, but it wasn't really until I was at the Cato Institute which was uh, a little over 20 years ago, uh, after working at uh, the White House and working with Ariana Huffington, that a colleague of mine, Jose Pinera, had said, okay, don't tell anybody, you have not yet <laughs> read these books. So <laughs> get on it, Grossman. And I did. And uh, I, I mean, I was just hooked within the first few lines. And I have since then read absolutely everything. I was just in getting a, in a Twitter flame thing on, uh, on, on Twitter. And somebody was saying, have you actually read any of her books? I'm like, yeah, I've read absolutely every one of her fiction, nonfiction, unpublished works, newsletters, uh, everything. And uh, it, I was so inspired to um, request and get an Ayn Rand license plate. So uh, I've been driving around with that for 20 years. On and, and, and so you have the California license plate Ayn Rand? Yes, I do. I, well, I think that I had to, because of the lettering, I had to take out the Y. Ah. But people, people used to recognize it a lot more, and people recognize it a lot less in the 20 years that I've had it, and the 15 years, you know, that I've uh, been out here. And so, you know, I, I think to me, that was part of my motivation for, for wanting to take this job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. And, and so how did you come to be the CEO of Alice Society? A strange, uh, you know, if I wasn't a good objectivist, I might say a higher power was at work. Ooh. But, <laughs> <laughs> sneaky, but, sneaky. <laughs> but no, no, actually, I, I, I mean, I think it was just a, a lifetime of uh, a relationships that I had built and um, they had an executive search going on. 
And I just wouldn't have ne necessarily come up on any of the, you know, as a, a usual suspect because I'm out here living in Malibu and, you know, um, I had been a senior vice president at a big corporation for the past 15 years. But um, David Kelly, our founder, was talking to uh, a woman who had spoken at one of the previous um, Atlas summits. And she said, well, what about Jennifer Grossman, you know, the Ayn Rand lady living up on the mountain in Malibu? And so they actually were very close to hiring a different candidate. But I spoke to David and um, then I spoke to Jay and they flew me in for a couple of interviews. And I, I was very surprised in a way, but I think it shows uh, the thoroughness and the professionalism that I've become um, used to there that they were so thorough. I mean, I have not had such a thorough background check <laughs> since my State Department days. You know, they just talked to absolutely every, everybody I knew and really grilled me and grilled me so much. I was like, well, I guess that, you know, I'm not going to get that job. But um, I did. And uh, what could anybody say? Um, you know, for me, it, it was a, a dream, a dream come true. And, and the people that know me all my life say, you're kidding, right? You're making that up. Like, this is your dream come true. And, and it really is. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, a couple, couple things. One, uh, bookmark on the house on the hill in Malibu and the, the Ayn Rand lady up in the Malibu. The, I, I think I want to get back to that. But taking, taking a step back, what was it that had you say yes? Because you have a particular, you could say, media savvy mm -hmm. approach to the world and communication and how you put yourself out in the world. Right. You ally yourself with people who are doing, you know, really visually stunning photography with Judd Weiss and Michael Newberry and the art. And you're bringing in animation with the with the tell your with the tell your story. Yeah. Right. There, there's there's these various things that you're doing. How how did that fit into Atlas Society and how do you what do you want to do? to expand Atlas Society's reach? What are your goals? Okay, that's a, a really good question. So uh, having been out of Washington for 20 years, out of the whole think tank milieu for, for a couple of de decades, um, and getting, getting reacquainted, because right before this, I helped a girlfriend of mine, Laura Ingram, launch a, a media property. So, you know, for about a year, I was still kind of re getting reconnected with a bunch of old friends. And what I found was, to my dismay, that in the past 20 years, uh, even though the cost of distribution of ideas, and, in, and that's what we're in, in the think tank world, mm -hmm. we're in the idea business. So uh, that the kinds of technologies, the kinds of um, visual technologies that have come online uh, make it a lot easier for us to um, to be able to do that. But what I found was that in the think tank world, not much has changed. And I, I hadn't seen um, many, particularly in D.C., that were taking, taking better advantage of, of some of these technologies. And I also knew from um, my experience mentoring and teaching uh, young people and young women in particular, and also having to launch um, all of the social media platforms for Dole once they came online, that uh, I, I knew sort of the um, content consumption habits of the younger generation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I could see that, you know, we really live in an age of visual social media. Our Instagram uh, channel is for me, our highest priority, it's even more important than our, our Facebook and Twitter. Um, and because that's where the young people are. You ask kids under 25, if, you know, and they usually don't even have a Facebook account. They're on Instagram. So I realized that we needed to uh, figure out how we were going to get content. And I didn't just want to curate content. We're not second-handers anyway. <laughs> uh, so I wanted to get user-generated content. And so I did that through, you know, the, the art contest. And so, uh, so far it's working. Mm -hmm. So, so 
uh, there's the Atlas Society, which has a history of doing academic work, putting out articles, putting on conferences, and you're coming in bringing a social media savvy to it so we can get the message out to more people who might not otherwise encounter it, especially the younger generation. Why do you think that's important? Another good question. Okay, so on my shelf back here, uh, I have I, I usually carry extra copies of Atlas Shrugged, um, and, and I have it in, in a whole bunch of different languages. And sometimes I would put together like networking evenings for, for young women, women from Pepperdine. Um, and, and also I do Airbnb. So I get a lot of people coming from all over the, the world. And this, I is, this is part of the Malibu house on the hill, the Ayn yes. Rand lady. I, I understand that when people come and stay at your Airbnb, that sometimes every once in a while they hear about Ayn Rand. Yeah, just occasionally <laughs> it, it happens. Uh, yeah, I mean, I do, I do not... I, I try to give them a very luxurious ex, you know, experience. I cook for them, I take them on hikes, but I'm not taking my NRA sticker off the front door, okay? And I'm not rearranging my book, my bookshelf. Uh, but, and so, you know, as, a, as I was having these younger guests as well, and young people that I was meeting and bringing into my home, or just being out there on, on the street and, you know, seeing with my license plate. And I would say, oh, well, well have you, read this book, blank out. Have you heard of this book? Blank out. Have you ever heard of Ayn Rand? Blank out. And I thought, wow, this is <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> because I thought that one of the biggest problems is that the left and the right and some objectivists, not mentioning any names here, themselves have done such a good job at marginalizing, you know, the, the Ayn Rand, the, the intellectual, the philosopher, the artist, and also these ideas. But primarily the left has have just completely taken her out of the schools because they know that this is such a transformative book that it is really gets people to start learning more about economics and about uh, the Constitution and what have you. So um, so that for many, many years, it, it was really, really difficult to uh, get beyond the stereotypes and the misconceptions and the lies that have been spread about Ayn Rand and to argue about it. But that's the Achilles heel of, the, of this plan by the left is that, okay, you guys have done such a good job that now I get to introduce Ayn Rand to the next generation all over again, and you don't control the narrative anymore. I get to present it in the way that I believe is true, and that will be most uh, emotionally compelling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and... I was just gonna add more, one more yeah. point, you know, that, that I would say that, uh, you know, in the think tank world, and I particularly, you know, just all across the board in the think tank world, you know, people do papers, they do lectures, you know, they do seminars, um, white papers. And I think we have a white paper problem in this movement uh, because when you you kind of rely on that very cerebral approach, you are limiting your audience to people who have the time, the inclination, and even the ability. To, to read and comprehend content in that way. So I, I really did feel that we needed to try to break out of the mold and get a little creative about how we were going to be communicating these ideas because guess what? It wasn't working. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, I, I like how you see people's both ignorance and misinformation as an opportunity. <laughs> what, what, I, guess, what? <laughs> I do, I'm definitely a glass half full kind of person yeah so. well so 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 i am i am as well one of the things i like about the fact that people are either ignorant or they have misinformation even as you could say especially the misinformation there's a certain percentage of people who they hate ayn rand because they align themselves with collectivists they align themselves with groups 
which hate Ayn Rand, and therefore they just kind of the the hate flows downhill, right? Haters gonna hate, and they hate her, even though they've never read her. Passionately. Yes, passionately. The only people, the only people who do hate her passionately are, are the people who haven't read who her. Who haven't read her. Full yes. Stop. Yeah. I have, I have yet to meet anyone who's actually read the books that decided they, you know, just they hate her and they hate the ideas. Yes. Or who actually read the books, not right. who held the book up to their eyes <laughs> and and pretended to read it while they were in, you know, just inside going, this is bullshit. Right. right? So uh, the, the people who have misinformation mm -hmm. typically have misinformation that is so bad that all it takes is that you offer a couple truths about Ayn Rand and now they're like, I really am ignorant. I really don't know about Ayn Rand. And everything that I've been told about her is bullshit. Like, I know people have said this about her, but with just a little bit of conversation, you find out she's actually not that at all. What else isn't true? Perhaps she's actually cool rather than evil. And, and I'll, I'll say oh, oh, over the years... I've turned a lot of people on to Ayn Rand. And uh, nine out of 10 had a negative opinion of Ayn Rand going in that was completely based on BS. It truly is, it truly is an opportunity, but then the question becomes, how do you reach them? If not through the white paper, if not through the technical philosophy, if not through the argumentation about fine points of you know, philosophical rigor, how do you reach them? Well, one way is that you use social media, but that's so simple. It's so simplistic. It doesn't capture the depth of Ayn Rand. How do you justify that? How do you make sense of that? I think that you can't justify a different kind of approach because, you know, you can write all of the scholarly papers that you want, which we are continuing to do. I mean, David Kelly, our founder, is uh, just submitting a, a paper that'll be coming out in the next uh, Journal of Ayn Rand Studies. Um, but I think that if you are just doing that and you're not paying attention to reality, the reality of how people consume information, where they consume information, and how you can most effectively communicate, then I think that's an unjustifiable approach. And I'm very eager to hear about your technique for, for turning people around because frankly, my uh, priority has just been, you know, haters gonna hate, <laughs> let them hate. And uh, the only way that I have kind of gotten those haters to turn around, so I think we should compare notes, is um, I just kill them with kindness, you know, because I think that one of the big, uh, I'm not even going to say misconceptions, because frankly, I've seen a lot of it, especially in the past, you know, several months as well. But uh, the, one of the biggest stereotypes about objectivists is that they're really kind of mean and you know, judge quickly, judge frequently, judge harshly, and uh, you know that they um, they have rough edges. So, one of my approach has been if somebody says something you know hateful, I'll just sometimes say, "Oh gosh, you know, I'm what a shame! It, it was so life changing for me." Uh, but by the way, you have such a cool like profile pic. Where'd you get it? <laughs> you know, and just start with lead with heart you know, start with heart, um, even though, you know, because people don't care. We've all heard it before. People don't care that you know until they know that you care. Mm -hmm. So that's really has been one of the ways that, that I've started. And I've also found that the sharing activity um, has been what has helped. Of, I think it's really what made the uh, Draw My Life, Ayn Rand Draw My Life vi go viral. And, you know, advertisers know this, too, that just kind of advertising and argumentation um, is what everybody wants is peer to peer reviews. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's who you trust. That's who you get information from.
Okay, well, so so to dig in a little bit into that, because this is, you could say, a central part of the strategy is getting people to share things mm -hmm. through social media. If, if we're saying, okay, let's deal with reality, and the reality is there are people who read white papers, there are people who read long blog articles, there are people who attend lectures, there are people, uh, all, you know, a, quite, a, quite a couple dozen uh, who read the Ayn Rand Journal, Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And then in reality, there are millions and hundreds of millions and perhaps even billions of people who are interacting on the Internet in a way that if there's a good piece of content that catches their attention, that can get them into the Ayn Rand orbit. And then as they get into the orbit, they can go more and more and more towards the center and refine their philosophy. But first you get attracted to her sense of life for the most part. Yes. And, and, and I experience a lot of the work that you're doing is looking to find alignment on that sense of life. Right. Like, yes. Yes. Yeah. And I, I feel that uh, sense of life is uh, what is most easily communicated visually. Mm -hmm. um, and I also like when, you know, when you were doing this motion, mm -hmm. that those, those are the people that are at the top of the, of the funnel. Right. And the people yes. that are going to the seminars, the people that are um, reading the white papers, they're they're already there. People aren't born objectivists. Mm -hmm. You know, they are uh, they are born with a need for philosophy. You can't exist without a philosophy. So uh, you can either, you know, as Ayn Rand has said, you can either uh, choose your philosophy consciously and logically or you will end up with a hodgepodge of ideas and you know catchphrases that uh, just are mixed together by um, happenstance. And so mm -hmm. I, I think that that is really what people ultimately need. But what is the, the way to get them started on, you know, to use a marketing term, their user journey? And so bringing them in and starting them um, with social media, I think is a, is a good way to go. Mm -hmm. And and so describe a little bit about the Draw Draw My Life campaign and what you were looking to accomplish and what you did and, and what, in terms of introducing people to the user experience of Ayn Rand and providing a marketing funnel or path for them to come down so that they get more and more into the center, into the philosophy beyond the sense of life. Mm -hmm. tell, tell me about Draw My Life and... Sure. Well, again, the backstory is really interesting because um, I, my parents had their 50th wedding anniversary recently, and I wanted to um, give them a unique present. And Draw My Life is a, a format of people narrating their life on a whiteboard that's become enormously uh, popular, you know, the most watched woman on YouTube, Jenna Marbles, has her Draw My Life. Celebrities have their Draw My Lives. And so I wanted to do a Draw Our Life for my parents. And so I, I started there, but I, I soon realized, wow, this just is not quite as easy as it looks. So I did a version of that that I could do on my own. And then when I came into um, Atlas, they had a video project that had been kind of you know, I think adrift, not really finding its way. And uh, that also, um, that they had, a, you know, the, we didn't have a lot of funds for it. And I also, you know, the board had a, a point of view that they felt that, uh, you know, we just, we just need to advance the principles that Ayn Rand herself is too radioactive. And I, I kind of disagreed with that. Uh, I thought if we were able to uh, reclaim the narrative that, um, that she's an important, and it's important to honor her and stay true to her. So, um, so I, I said, well, let's do a Draw My Life of Ayn Rand. And uh, you know, this is a format people already like, hashtag Draw My Life. You can see a lot of the, the stuff that's out there. And so I went through a process of evaluating, evaluating a couple of vendors. I was very, very blessed to have um, Patrick Reasonover and his uh, Just Add Firewater team take 
agree to take it on. I mean, they are graduates of the Atlas summer seminars and longtime objectivists, but just unbelievably creative brilliantly. But uh, we still had a low budget and I am a bit of a control freak and I knew exactly what I wanted. So for that video, I did the script. I uh, drew all of the drawings myself and you'll see this ring, it's my grandmother's ring, in them. Um, and I did the narration, hence the so so Russian accent. So, th so that's what we did. But for these next two draw my lives, uh, the Hank Reardon and the Dagny, which are, which are which are forthcoming. The, those will be out shortly. Yes, we are doing in fact a private screening of them on Thursday for our board in Washington D.C. Um, and so everybody, stay tuned. And if you go on our Instagram channel and our Facebook channel, you get you know some behind the scenes. Um, footage and uh, teasers. So uh, so for those, we went more you know professional and I'll, I'll be very interested to see how it, it works. I mean, um, so with Hanks, we had a, a wonderful illustrator and uh, the same guy narrated it. For Dagny, um, again, professional illustrator. So I'll, anyway, the reason I'm mentioning that is one of the reasons that medium is so, uh, effective is that another watchword for this generation, the, the native generation, the millennial generation to social media is authenticity. Mm -hmm. And so they don't want to watch an ad. And so when they are seeing something which is looks okay, but is not really that professional and um, has a little bit of errors here and there, uh, they are, um, they're more compelled. They find it more believable and they kind of like, you know, it's like comedy. Are you really watching what's going to happen next? This is happening. This is a real person doing it. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm looking forward to the experiment. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay. And, and so this, this, this brings us into the characters. Let's say that you're successful and you bring <laughs> in more eyes. Yeah. Let's just say, let's so, just so say. You bring in more eyes to Ayn Rand. They, they enter the user experience. You're getting more and more people into the funnel by using social media, by using uh, media that they're used to consuming. Mm -hmm. yes. Where do they go? What characters do they uh, emulate? What, what is the ideal path that you want them to go on once they get in, introduced? Well... Uh, that, that's a, a really good question as well. And in fact, the uh, donor, uh, anonymous donor, long time, um, very generous, uh, very successful objectivist businessman who um, sponsored the last, these, the tank and the Dagny, uh, said, you know, I really want to make sure that at the end of the day, we're, we're selling books. So the, the ending is a little bit tweaked. And uh, I mean, unfortunately, you know, Atlas Society doesn't control the rights to the, to the books. So uh, if anybody out there wants to donate a stack of books, um, you know, I, I, I would love to have been able to uh, have the next step, step of action is that, you know, if you sign up for our reading group and we have, you know, an Atlas Shrugged reading group, then uh, and you you know take this action you share it you you comment um, for the first hundred people that do that we will supply you with the book um, because I do think that the books are part of the the entryway process. J just in case anyone listening wanted to donate a hundred books, you would use them towards that effect. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, okay. Just just checking. Not only that, we're, uh, I mean, not to get too off topic, but um, we have a whole Lead Rand campaign. And uh, one of the um, components that I, I haven't launched yet, we're looking for funding, is a random act of mindness that would Ooh. become social media where we would leave copies of Atlas Shrugged. We'd uh, get street teams across the country and we'd give them each like a dozen books and that every week or month they would put a book near, you know, a, a famous landmark or, you know, the bench that's right across in Central Park from this statue uh, and that they would all have inscriptions um, saying, you know, this book changed my life. I hope it will change yours. Mm -hmm. So, um, but anyway, so, but there's a bunch of, of so, different- So, so, so let's, let's say, 
that mm -hmm. someone sees an Instagram pic with, mm -hmm. an, with an interesting quote, or they see a Draw My Life of Vine Rand or Hank Reardon, uh, Dagny Taggart. So this, who's your vote for the next one? Oh, I'm, I'm all about Dagny. Okay. Well, hopefully you're gonna I, like I'm this. all about Dagny. Dag <laughs> it, Dagny does it for you. It, well, so when, when I read Atlas Shrugged, I was a postmodern socialist feminist. Get out of town. And I read Atlas Shrugged and it kicked my butt. I, I read it five times in the first year because I, I read it and I went, God, that was brilliant. But I mean, of course she's wrong about X, Y, and Z. But she was right about this. So I had like I read it again and read it again. And Dagny was for me the ultimate feminist figure. And and Dagny was sort of the bridge for me. This was a powerful woman who was not bowing to any gender stereotypes, was not she, she just didn't she just did what she wanted to do because she wanted to do it. I, I had a I had a mentor named Robert McDonald, actually down your way. It'd be fun to connect the two of you. Oh. But he, he used to say, he defined independence. And he says, independence is doing what you want to do, even if your parents want you to do it. <laughs> That's a good one. Right? And it's the brilliance because it's not, you're not fighting anything. You're not trying to prove that you're not like your parents. Mm -hmm. You're doing what you want to do because you believe it is true and right. It's, re it's reality, uses reason, you're taking responsibility, you're demonstrating respect in service of realization, right? This is what it means to be a good human being. And Dagny was that. And so she was sort of the bridge. It was a woman character, first of all, and of course, because I was a good feminist, that was good, <laughs> right? It's like, Good, a strong woman character. I had never encountered anyone like Dagny before. And, yeah, well, and so, so right. Dagny, Dag, Dagny's my vote, but. Yeah, I was also though saying that, you know, and, and I, I have a little bit of this in the draw my life, that um, for me, so many women struggle with overgiving, you know, codependence, boundaries, putting, you know, everybody first rather than themselves, sacrificing and, uh, and, ident and identifying with that. And it's a struggle. And so, you know, in a way, Dagny as well, I think had a little bit of that problem, you know, because she was not putting herself first. She was, you know, putting her work first and she was putting, you know, the, the railroad first. Um, so I, I also feel that there's, uh, I, I do agree on the feminist angle and the, the liberated woman angle, which was fantastic. But, um, but I also think that she appeals to even more, you know, as you say, basic problems that, that women and men, but I think particularly women struggle with on a regular basis. Yeah, you, you, you could say that I came into, uh, I came into Atlas Shrugged and objectivism as a second stage feminist, right? I was pretty hard, Andrea Dworkin, Catherine McKinnon. I was, I was pretty heavy on that. And I came out of it sort of an equity feminist, feminist in the Christina Hoff Summers mm -hmm. category, factual feminist. It's like, it's about equality. It's about respect. It's not about special privilege. Okay, so, so people, find the content and then they come in and they read the books. Mm -hmm. What is, why does that matter to you? Why do you, when people come over say, have you read this book? Really? Why, what, what is the path that you see for them such that once they go down this path, something happens that's good. What is it? What, what do you want to have happen? I do this because like Ayn Rand, I love my fellow man. And I want to see them avoid needless suffering. I want to see them avoid the kinds of suffering that I have self-inflicted or walked you know, right into. And I feel that by reading that book, 
you will be inspired by, Caro by characters that were meant to be inspiring and that it will change your life. And at some point you may or you may not decide to go further down the path and um, partake of some of the resources that, you know, the Atlas Society and, and the Ayn Rand Institute, you know, have to offer uh, and get more into the, the philosophy. Um, we're gonna be coming out with an online um, introduction to objectivism using a similar draw my life kind of technique. But mostly you will have just a, you will have imbued a different way of looking at the world and it will be that sense of life that you will um, take out into the world and, and I think live a, a happier life and, and live a fairer life and live a, uh, a more just life because you, know, you will be living for yourself but also not expecting other people to, to live for you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so, so this brings up the hot topic of the last couple months around the article that you did on can you, can you appreciate Ayn Rand and God at the same mm -hmm. time, right? And, and the responses that you've gotten to that. And I want to get into that in just a moment. Um, you've made a distinction between the sense of life and the philosophy, mm -hmm. right? And uh, I, think, I think that's a very useful distinction. I know a lot of people who have read Ayn Rand who go, you know what? I just like her fundamental attitude. It's no bullshit. It's, it's be smart, think for yourself, live for yourself, be cool with the people, you know, trade with the people you want to trade with and create something great with your life. Right? These are these fundamental sense of life issues. Mm -hmm. And earlier you were saying that Objectivism has a reputation for people being unkind, quick to judge, judge, judging harshly, judging in the starkest possible terms. Right? Yeah. So to say evil is not uncommon for an objectivist, right? In this in this mold, and the sense of life of that kind of provocation and argument has a particular flavor to it. In, in my work as a, as a coach, I've been working, you know, I work to have people have great lives. And for me, objectivism is a primary tool if you want to have a great life, right? Non-contradictory happiness. This is the goal. <laughs> to, to live a great life, you need great tools. I sometimes summarize it down into two parts. I, I say, don't be an idiot and don't be an asshole. Right? And, and Ayn Rand objectivism is fantastic on not being an idiot. Mm -hmm. Right? It's like, hey, no, no, deal with reality, use reason, take 100% responsibility, show respect to others, and live in service of realization, something that's worthwhile. Mm -hmm. The logic, the rigor of the philosophy in terms of not being an idiot is epic. It's epic, it's systematic, and everyone can benefit from it. I have absolutely no doubt of that. But on the other side, in sense of life, there's how you feel about life, but how do you feel about other people? And do you treat them like crap? Do you, are you demeaning to them? Are you shame thing? Are you an asshole? And, and I, I agree, unfortunately, while Francisco was not an asshole. John Galt was not an asshole. Dagny was not an asshole. Rourke was not an asshole. Hank was not, like none of her heroes were assholes, right? They didn't, they didn't morally preach to one another except during their speeches. Right. And their speeches were always summaries, but you know, I, I always like to tease people. I say, remember the scene in Atlas Shrugged where Dagny was harping on Hank Reardon because he was concerned about being married and she was just ripping him a new. And it's like, no, you don't remember that scene because it didn't happen. Right? Dagny let Hank make his mistakes and she mm -hmm. treated him with respect in the ways that she wanted to meet with him. And so I appreciate that you're coming out and saying, look, let's, we don't need to fight. We can attract people through the sense of life and we can get people to read the books and, and take on more of that sense of life so it can speak for them. But then there's this argument 
But that's not what objectivism is. It's not just sense of life. It's not just the fountainhead. It's not even just Atlas Shrugged. It's introduction to objectivist epistemology. It's the objectivist ethics. It's uh, the romantic manifesto. It's capitalism, the unknown ideal. And these are philosophical where you must use reason to get down and take apart the ideas and rigorously ex explore them, put them against each other, like reason it out and use rationality. And that, that's really different than sense of life. I know people who have read Ayn Rand and they have the basic sense of life, but they don't know the arguments. They don't know the philosophy. And this is the, the danger, the concern around this, the method you're suggesting, which is let's lead with sugar. Let's lead with honey, not vinegar. Well, let me point out yes. that philosophically, with a philosophy that holds reason as its only absolute, to lead with vinegar and not honey is to not act in accordance with the philosophy. It is not to be rational. It is not to be reasonable. It is to ignore reality, okay? And you can ignore reality, as Ayn Rand says, but you cannot ignore the consequences of reality. So if you are purely rational, then you will understand and you will be willing to admit that a certain way of approaching people and relating to them is counterproductive. If you have zero emotional intelligence, but you are purely rational, that is reality. So to me, there's no contradiction to those things. This happens to be the way I am, okay? Mm -hmm. I am friendly, I have a lot of friends. Uh, you know, I post people here, but make no mistake mm -hmm. that I'm taking this approach because I believe here and here that this is the rational way to expand the movement, to attract people, to change the branding, because we got a huge branding problem. So I am, this was a, a strategy that was logically conceived mm -hmm. that uh, implied these kinds of techniques, and that's exactly what I've done. So, you know. Well, uh, okay. So, so, so I want to I want to get into your article on God and especially you could say Ankar and your own response to it, but but to push on that point for a moment, so what's the difference between being Peter Keating, and saying what people want to hear, and saying that you can be both an objectivist and believe in God, like how is isn't it just? No, right. it's not. And actually, um, I mean, you can read uh, David's contested legacy of Ayn Rand. You can read um, his unrugged individualism, which is one of my favorites uh, and most classics of his work, which we have also now just put into audio, um, an audio book version. So I, I highly recommend, you know, that you do that. And I mean, you know, I've, I've gotten to know David pretty darn well um, over the, uh, the course of, of the past, uh, you know, eight or 10 months. And uh, I can see that you can be uncompromising in your fidelity to principle, and yet you can be kind and gentle and um, polite in, in the way that you treat people. And, you know, so I really don't see, um, see any, you know, Peter Keating is doing it just to be liked. Okay. He's just to doing it to, you know, advance his career. 
Um, I'm doing it because I want to introduce people to Ayn Rand's books, her ideas. And so, you know, I, I think it also depends on your motivation for why you are trying to use uh, the kind of communication, the kind of words, or at least avoid using uh, certain words that are, um, you know, counterproductive to your, your purposes. Mm -hmm. And in, in my case, I think this is a, a pretty um, noble purpose mm -hmm. of which I am very proud. <laughs> Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. So, so to, to further explicate this, because I think as someone who loves Ayn Rand, like I, I love what she has created herself, her, the, the scope of her creativity inspires me. Mm -hmm. The detail of her work has educated me. It shaped everything that I do. There's, there's no part of my life that it doesn't touch. I love her. And so anything that will get people to actually be introduced to her, I'm pretty good. I'm pretty good with. But the question becomes, if the way that you market to them is somehow inconsistent with the actual philosophy of non-contradiction, is there a problem there? And that brings us to your article. And so I'd like you to say kind of what you were doing, what happened, the responses, your responses to the response. What, what's been going on with you around this? Okay, so it came from the Draw My Life and being, I mean, we got 1.2 million total views and 12,000 shares and just thousands of, of comments. And uh, so for me, this was a, a marketing, you know, exercise, an educational exercise, but it was also a, a research project, a data gathering project. And so I, as I was really looking into the kinds of uh, responses that we were getting on um, Facebook, a couple of things occurred to me. One was that we were getting you know, uh, negative, because <laughs> like you said, there's, we were, you know, sparking controversy and, and a lot of the negative ones that were coming up were saying, were, were bringing up atheism. And it was usually like, she was an atheist who died in public housing. Okay. Which we know was a lie. Well, except she, she wasn't, she wasn't, no, she, she was an atheist, definitely an atheist. Yes. Um, and so, uh, then I would sometimes, like I say, you know, I would go into their profile. I would kind of look and see who, who, who this is. And this wasn't an evangelical, it wasn't a conservative, it wasn't a William F. Buckley type. A lot of times these were people that clearly, as you say, had aligned themselves with sort of collect collectivist groups that had a stamped opinion of uh, Ayn Rand, approved opinion of Ayn Rand. So I was like, this is interesting. Why are, why are they doing that? Um, and I also, in response to those what I would see that as people would say, oh, she was an atheist. I saw tons of people jumping in and saying, you know, so, so what? I, I'm, you know, a born again Christian. And I uh, love Ayn Rand. I even got one person saying, I read Ayn Rand and that made me become a more, you know, devoted Jew. So I was like, hmm, there's really something going on there. I also was finding as I was going out, I'm talking to a whole bunch of different groups, conservative groups. Um, libertarian groups, <laughs> any group, uh, that I was finding that, particularly among the conservative groups, uh, people were saying, well, I, I don't want to read uh, Atlas Shrugged because, you know, she's an atheist and I'm a strong pro-lifer and I'm a strong Christian and this and that. And then it was also, you know, a big part of my job is fundraising. And I'm going out and I'm, I'm seeing that people are, are kind of having the, the same um, problem. At the same time, I'm introducing new people to Atlas Shrugged, including, you know, my parents, who somehow made it through life. And they're both big, big li liberals. My mother's a social worker. Uh, and my dad, you know, is is uh, a, a religious Jew, or at least an observant Jew, very spiritual man. And um, they both read the books. And 
you know, they didn't kind of, uh, they took away a whole bunch of things because I asked them, like, really, what did you get out of it? And it, it, they didn't say, you know, wow, I, I just, you know, clearly she's asking us to, to not be religious. So um, I decided I was looking at a, uh, an, uh, an article on this and I, I just, I put, put it together and I felt, and I also was talking to people that were, you know, friends like Andy Puzder, who's our new secretary of labor, yay. And uh, Randy Wallace, you know, who wrote Braveheart Lives Out Here and We Were Soldiers. And he also wrote the screenplay of, of Alice Shrugged for Angelina Jolie that never got published. Um, and, you know, Andy is a Catholic. He made all of his six kids read uh, The Fountainhead and Mere Christianity before they could get their driver's license. Did you say and, and Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis? Yes. Yes. Okay. Before they could get their driver's license. And, and Randy is, a, you know, a Southern Baptist, but loves Ayn Rand enough to write a screenplay about her, one of the greatest screenwriters of our time. So um, that's where I wrote the op-ed, and internally we did have some um, interesting politics because uh, <laughs> David's reaction to it was, uh, I'd say, pretty much very similar to um, Euron's and Ankar's. Um, and I, I still disagreed. I said, you know, there's an empirical question that yes, obviously you can love um, God and Ayn, and Ayn Rand, lots of people do. Uh, and my major point was that I think that this is being used as a stick to get people away from the books. And I, I want to take that stick away. So um, so that's, that's kind of what led up to it. And that's how it got published. And I would say the reaction, I got uh, hundreds, hundreds of emails, thousands of, you know, Facebook comments, and they were 99% positive, which is pretty amazing. Um, but, you know, the self-described purists decided that uh, they needed to, to respond. And um, I think they pr probably did it. I'm not too, you know, they, they did because they believe what they believe. But, I, you know, it just, it did seem a little harsh. And I wonder if they they really are kind of feeling that, you know, this might be an approach that works, that there may, may be quite a, a big market of people out there, um, like, you know, the men I mentioned, that uh, uh, love both Ayn Rand, and I'm not saying they're calling themselves objectivists, they, they like the books, they like her, they like her principles, um, and they're, they're also uh, religious people. So, so that is the story. Mm -hmm. and, and with the responses that the, Let's say your own Ankar, even even David, these purists, mm -hmm. right? You, you refer to them as purists. They they say essentially that objectivism is about reason, religion is about faith. These are incompatible. That if it is true that some people can you can love Ayn Rand and you can love God and you can love Christianity. Mm -hmm. But can you be can you be a full objectivist no. and love Christianity? No, and that is not what I was suggesting. That's you know um, not that I picked the title. You know you don't get to pick your titles or subtitles when you, you write op eds. Um, but nowhere in that that's maybe what they wanted to read in that. Mm -hmm. But nowhere in that article, if you read it carefully, and I think today actually it is up in full on our website because we're after the 30 days right, right. where you can't reprint it. So I, I do welcome The firewall everybody. is coming down. The firewall is, is coming down. Uh, so maybe we'll have even a second wind of, of things. So no, obviously um, it, they're not uh, compatible. And like uh, even Yaron said that um, you can compartmentalize, you know, you can um, believe in reason as the only absolute and then you can believe in religion. And he says people compartmentalize all the time. Is it good for you? Is it psychologically healthy? I don't know. Okay. So, so, so this, I don't know. I'm going to look at, uh, you know, I just, I know what I see and I see a bunch of, uh, you know, religious Ayn Rand fans. They seem pretty good. And I see a bunch of, you know, objectivist atheists. Uh, I, 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 are they, you know, more emotionally healthy? Uh, they should be. 
Okay, according to the philosophy, they should be. Are they living better lives? They should be. Are they? I don't know. I haven't done, you know, I, I just have anecdotal, maybe. Mm -hmm. So, 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 so when, you, when you say that, it sounds like you have an opinion. I, I think that, you know, there are, no, I mean, there are a bunch of hypocritical people that are hypocrites all, all over the place. Um, but I, I think there is a really uh, interesting um, passage in John Allison's um, uh, book, the, the Financial Crisis and the Market Cure. Yeah, and the Free Market Cure. And the Free Market Cure, right. Um, I mean, which is just really interesting. And um, maybe later on we can put the, uh, the book, the page in there. And, you know, he's, he's saying essentially the, the same thing that I was saying. Um, I mean, he was even saying that there were, you know, Christian objectivists. I'm not going that far. I'm, I'm just saying, listen, this book is good for you. You know, I think it'll make you a better person. At the very least, you should be a literate person. Okay? <laughs> It's just part of the canon and, of the and, Western and, tradition. Yes, it's, it's part of the canon of the Western tradition. It's, again, an absolute classic in terms of feminism. And if you're going to have an opinion about the woman, read her damn ep opus magnum. Right? Re right? Read her work. Please. That's really my primary. Opinion. Okay. So, so uh, what, one of the metaphors I use is like it's this spiral. Where you're on the outside and you catch some of her sense of life and then maybe you learn a little bit about her politics and a little bit about egoism and reason and metaphysics and right and the close the more you study her the more you get down into the essence which it, which we'll call objectivism right which is that you can't have you can't have faith the compartments allow for contradiction in she she talks about floating abstractions and stolen concepts when you've got your thinking compartmentalized, you can end up with contradictions and those contradictions can screw up your life. But don't be an idiot and don't be an asshole, right? If you, because if you're, and this is kind of what I hear you saying is there are people who are not assholes. They're, they're basically Christian. Although my guess is the more you get into Ayn Rand, the more you question your Christianity down in its essence. But the more objectivist you become, the more you read her, the more you start, you're going to start to question everything that's based on faith. You're going to start bringing the compartments together. What I, he what I hear you doing, and I, I will say, I appreciate it. I do something similar myself, and I'm, and I'm always concerned about it. Which is that when I, when I invite people to read Ayn Rand and I don't say, okay, by the way, here are the things that you're going to confront. You're going to have to give up this. You're going to have to give up this. You're going to have, right? All of the things that you're building your life on, you're basically going to be giving up. Now here, read this. That doesn't work as well as saying, this is a really interesting book. And you here, here, here are some of the ideas in it. Read it and confront it. And I will allow you to go through that spiral and confront all of the things that you need to confront, but you don't need to do it all up front. And I'm not going to start with the hardest objections up front. And that's the tack I saw you take in your article. And I, I thought, well, go jag, <laughs> right? And whoa, I wonder how the feathers are going to fly on this one. Yeah. And, uh, and they have, although I will tell you that um, my board loved it. I have a lot of friends in the movement, people that are on the boards of other um, sister organizations, let's say, within the liberty movement. They all loved it. I, I got, the most interesting thing was the, the letters that I got from people that are in leading positions at, at think tanks. OK, and who are objectivist atheists who really said, you know, this is this was important and that it needs to be done. And I, I think that you need to start with a diagnosis of reality. OK, and a prioritization of the problem. And I don't think 
the problem is that we don't have enough philosophically pure objectivists in the world. The problem is that we, we are, don't have enough people reading Ayn Rand. So I think right now that's, that's where I'm, I'm starting. Some of the, the shifts that I've introduced at the Atlas Society is to focus a little bit more on introduction on that top of the, the funnel. Mm -hmm. And then also that we have uh, officially kind of um, included what has always been there, but as uh, benevolence as one of our, our highest values and, mm -hmm. and principles. Um, it's, it's, so. one of, it's one of the things that the Atlas Society is, is built on. It's like, yes. don't be an idiot and don't be a jerk. <laughs> right. <laughs> because it's the right thing to do not to be a jerk. And it's also the rational thing to do. It's also the self-interested thing to do. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and at some point in this funnel, people are going to have all of their ideas challenged. Yeah including yes you are a christian and you are an objectivist if you're going to take this seriously you're going to end up questioning that now i'll, I'll, I'll say I, I wrote a book uh i wrote a book that a catholic priest helped me write and edit and i eventually put him on as a co-author mm -hmm. and it, it's a book on rational spirituality but I'm comfortable using the Christian lens as part of the book because it, it was written, really designed for a non-denominational approach to spirituality, something that religious people could use or atheists could use. Mm -hmm. To really look at what is the self and spirit of human beings. Right? What is the spiritual life, the life of meaning and love and vision and purpose? Uh, you, you start off and, and you said, you know, like Ayn Rand, I am a lover of mankind. Right? I am a lover of what, hu what is possible for human beings, and I want to do everything in my power to move that forward. And, Let me add one, one last thing that was yeah. really important in my motivation and I think in the overarching goals of, of what we're trying to do with the Atlas Society. And I'm, I keep on touching the screen because I'm about to lose power. <laughs> okay. But... Um, but I was not speaking to objectivists primarily. They weren't my primary audience. I was speaking to, to Christians and to religious people. And part of the conversation that, that I, I want to have with them is I'm, I'm not trying to turn them into atheists. I, you know, as I said, I want them to read the book. But ultimately, what I think that I want to communicate is that we need a secular moral foundation for freedom and for economic um, free markets because uh, you know I lost you there so um, anyway the last point that I was making was that as in speaking to Christians that I would like to make the case that we need more than a religious foundation for the morality of capitalism we need it because we have a diversity of religions in this country we need it because we, for better or for worse, you know, are living in an increasingly secular society. And so that we really need to, to ground our um, moral defense of capitalism in a secular, rational way. And that's really what um, Ayn Rand provides. So, so that, that's kind of part of my, my end game of trying to broaden the tent to bring in um, people who are Christians and who like Ayn Rand, or people who are religious and have been afraid of Ayn Rand. Because ultimately, we, we do need a secular moral foundation to defend freedom. Yes. And, and we can say that we need, we need a secular morality to support and to generate the politics that we want. Right? We, we, politics right. requires a morality. And if we can get a rational morality... Then we need the rational. We need to have reason and non-contradiction all the way down, including challenging faith eventually. But that path to create a rational morality, you can, uh, you can learn a lot of the rational morality before you go through and completely clean up your epistemology. And so I appreciate that you're bringing mm -hmm. people into the Atlas Society orbit and in just to the Ayn Rand orbit.
for everyone who's teaching about Ayn Rand, you're bringing people in so that they can confront these ideas and in the process go deeper and deeper and deeper to the point where they're really working on non-contradiction and reason and epistemology focused on metaphysics all the way down. But you don't necessarily need to start there. And I thought it was a bold move. And I'm, I'm glad that it's generated some controversy so that we can have this conversation and perhaps create a wider tent for people to come in and at least just taste Ayn Rand. Just give her a taste. You might find that you like it. Yes. I would like to say that I felt that Ayn Rand needed a Hail Mary pass. And so that's what I did. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, Jennifer, Andrew, Grossman, Jag. Thanks for the work that you're doing for uh, Atlas Society and for participating here. So can you do a quick rundown of where people, of, of our social media? Because yes. I know it's Atlas, there's different, different slight names for different services. What, if people want to follow well, you know, you us. Can just, yeah, go on um, the, the different platforms, go on Instagram, search for Atlas Society, you know, the logo will come up. Go on Twitter, Atlas Society, and then Facebook, Atlas Society. And that's, that's the best place to go. Uh, and then if you want, you can go on the site and you can ask to be signed up for the newsletter. But, um, but do go on the site, which is www.atlassociety.org. And there you'll find the, the complete non-firewalled version of the Wall Street Journal article, as well as the, the Draw My Life video. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Atlassociety.org. There's all kinds of great resources there. Go there learn this stuff because it makes your life better it makes your life better so thank you jennifer okay. thanks so much okay anytime the becoming an ayn rand hero podcast is sponsored by the composer darren john lewis whose music i use for this podcast if you'd like a custom choral or symphonic piece for your special event or celebration, or if you'd just like to hear more of his music, go to DarrenJohnLewis.com. That's D-A-R-I-N-J-O-H-N-L-E-W-I-S.com. Thank you, and see you in the next episode of Becoming an Ayn Rand Hero.